Good evening, friends. I was trying to get my fish to play with the laser light, but they was too busy staring at me, trying to break through the glass and get some food. They hadn't been fed today. So instead of playing them, watching them play with the laser light this time, maybe next time, I'll show you them eating. He's got a whole cube in his mouth. Look at that. These are brain shrimp. Brain shrimp cubes. They taste disgusting. They taste kind of like iron. But don't ask me how I know that. It's a little compressor seps. That's what they are called. I have two compressor seps, the silver ones. I mean, I can tell you what all of these are. Uh, this green one is a Venustus. That's an orange blotch peacock. This is an orange blotch peacock. All the blotchy ones, those are orange blotch peacocks. This is a dragon blood. I don't know what this one is, actually. I can't tell you about that, but most of them. I'm going to drop a few cubes, if I can do it, with this holding the camera. I drop them in there, they're having the time of their lives. They're in paradise right now except for the ones without a cube. I wish I could get them to play with this laser light. Let me see, they usually do. It's kind of dim though. Wait, there it is. Well, you see the compressor steps wanted to eat it. Red Empress wants to eat it. That's the kind of fish it is. Sometimes I can get them to play with it where they're all pecking around on the ground after it. They're interested in other things. What about this? Somebody else is interested. Yeah. <laughs> One of my cats, I can make him go around in a circle till he gets dizzy, but not Snickers. She's too sensible, aren't you? When the heck are you going to pounce, Snickers? Sick of you. <laughs> okay. I need to get down to business. I suppose. Oops. Going to look at the tank this way now. I'm a little disappointed I couldn't show you how they like to play with the laser light, but believe me, they do. I'm going to try them again with the next video, and next video I'm going to be sure to find Mia. It's just she goes upstairs in the office and sleeps a lot. She doesn't hang out downstairs with me like Tuna and Snickers do. But... Despite the lack of Mia, felt like I needed to give you something uh, for Disability Module 1. 
on Nancy Island's dis The Disabled God and <clears throat> the Models of God. So this particular talk is going to be on Nancy Island and the Disabled God. The next one's going to be on Models of God. And for the next one, I'm going to hunt Mia down if it's the last thing I do. And you'll get to have a good look at her. And the other one, Jasper. Usually I make these videos at night. And Jasper, he's always upstairs in bed sleeping with my spouse who goes to bed earlier than me. Which is not hard to, to do. But... I'll do my best to get all the cats in <clears throat> for the end of the semester. I hope you all are doing well. I know it can be really uh, tough living through this time, so I wish I wish every one of you the best. Want to help in any way I can. And right now, I'm going to try to help by talking to you about Nancy Island's book the disabled god and she summarizes this book <clears throat> in that article i sent um that i put out for you all to read as a substitute so let me just get to it now my understanding is that the political disability rights movement it began in earnest in the 1960s and 1970s around the time that many other rights movements were getting started like civil rights movement um, and queer rights movement but disability wasn't the subject of sustained Christian theological reflection from a disability rights perspective until the mid 1990s. Well, that's quite a gap there. Is Nancy Island's book, The Disabled God, published in 1994, uh, that was the first academic theological work that adopted a disability rights approach. It was authored by an insider to the experiences of disability, and it has become the foundational work in my opinion, in disability theology as a field. Of course, disability, disability had been written about in Christian theology before 1994, but um, these works weren't in line the, with the liberative goals of the disability rights movement. They had quite a different um, perspective that they were coming from. And these works tended toward exclusion of the voices of people with disabilities, and particularly the voices of people with um, intellectual, social, emotional disabilities. And this allowed for disabled people to be manipulated in theological reflection to suit the particular author's theological ends. For example, theologian Stanley Haueros, Haueros, he was himself an outsider to the experience of disability. After he became friends for I mean, some period of time with a person who had an intellectual disability, he um, recounted, quote, once I had been drawn into the world of the mentally handicapped, it did not take me long to realize they were the crack I desperately needed to give concreteness to my critique of modernity, unquote. So Howard Ross, as part of his critique of this so-called liberal idea, ideal of autonomy, asks, Quote, 
How do we make sense of those among us whose very existence can be nothing but dependence? Unquote. I mean, I guess this is legitimate. You know, it's it's a legitimate avenue of inquiry. But what's problematic is that Haros relies on the testimonies of parents, rehabilitative organizations, and other caregivers to flesh out his understanding of intellectual disability. He doesn't ask a disabled person what they want or how they feel. He's kind of using them as a tool to make a theological argument in opposition to ideals of autonomy. And I I just think it's so important to actually dwell at length on the testimonies and accounts of people who have experienced um, physical, emotional, social, intellectual disabilities. But against this backdrop, Nancy Island's book, The Disabled God, was uh, in disability scholar Deborah Beth Creamer's words, clearly revolutionary in the field of disability theology. Creamer, who you're also reading for this week, describes Island's contribution as a paradigm shift away from prior apolitical outsiders' reflections, like, for example, um, Haworos's, and then other, like, more benign pastoral theologies and pieces on religious education and devotion. Like, those are all, like, approaching disability from an apolitical perspective, not taking an interest in the disability rights movement. But... Iceland, uniquely up to that time, she operates in a liberationist mode of reflection that was influenced by feminist theology. Iceland breaks new ground in incorporating into her theology of disability a number of liberationist principles. And among these, are the epistemological privilege of people with disabilities and God's solidarity with disabled people. Iceland takes an insider's approach, which I think is worth noting, to disability theology. She herself, she struggled with um, a congenital bone condition in her hips and spinal scoliosis which caused her a great deal of pain and immobility 